We're going to go back and I'll give you some context as to, to who I am and how I kind of came to be this way. And, um, and, and who we are is, is not really for everyone. Um, the special forces selection process is this arduous kick in the dick. Is it not? <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, but they're looking for a very specific type of person and there's a spectrum, you know, you have like Wim Hof, you know who that guy is? Yeah. Guy's kind of crazy and tough, right? Submerges himself in cold things. And he believes that everything that happens and what you're able to endure happens internally. And, and he, per, he perpetuates these ideas that like, this is how you're able to like accomplish these insurmountable feats is being able to control your mind. I mean, I get that. That's definitely on the spectrum. That's important. I've been in war with dudes and I'm looking at them like, dude, that, that, that guy's like 120 pounds when he's soaking wet, I could break him in half, you know, but then when bullets start flying, he just shows up and he's fierce and he's powerful and he's frightening. And I would never want to be on the other end of that. But then I look at Win Hoff and I'm like, me and all of my friends can pick him up, tear him in half, beat him to death with our bare hands. So there's a, there's a spectrum of this physicality of what I can do externally to what I can do internally. One of the soft truths, the very first one, is that humans are more important than hardware. And I fully, truly believe that from the bottom of my heart. That, um, as a matter of fact, I'm in the middle of a 15-6 investigation. If anybody know, knows what that is, that means I'm being investigated for um, doing something bad in the military. One was fraud, waste, and abuse of government stuff. And when I wrote my... Uh, my sworn statement, I led with the soft truth. I said that I believe that humans are more important than hardware and I will absolutely, without a moment of hesitation, give the trash that the taxpayers paid for to my people to be able to make sure that they're successful in their mission and that I am too. Another one is that quality is better than quantity. Another soft truth is that you cannot mass produce special operations. But that first one, that humans are more important than hardware, that is very connected to the fact that quality is better than quantity. So then how do we get better quality humans? Well, when we have thousands of people applying to come to special forces and I can hand pick who they are, cool, that, I get to pick quality. I get it. And I get to train them how I want. It's pretty handy. Well, we're not afforded that in the civilian wonderful world that we have, we actually have to do it for ourselves. So us as individuals, how do we, on this spectrum of being one hard, tough, hey guys, shoe person, you're welcome. I'm, I'm going to have to tailor all of this, these little fellas in the front, to um, an external monster. I want both. I want people to look at me and be like, that dude is absolutely frightening. Don't make eye contact. I did it. Dang it. What's coming? Um, also to like this endearing, sweet, gregarious human that you that you want to spend time with. Like this can exist on the same spectrum of, of who, can I be a monster? And can I also be the same caring human? Absolutely. And I think that's the goal of, of what we want to be. So when I was young, uh, my dad was a narcotics officer undercover for a long time. Most of my childhood, we had a, a literal red phone in the, in the closet that when it would ring, we had a cover story, a cover for action. I would pick up the phone and somebody with a really trashy uh, Mexican accent, and I would have exactly, I would, I'd almost have a script being able to tell this person, this, this drug distributor, what my dad was doing to make sure his, his cover for his story was accurate. By the time I was eight, we're in uh, parking garages, and he's like, ah, so uh, I don't really have a warrant, but I need to know who owns that yellow Camaro sons, eight-year-old Tim and 10-year-old Nick, will you guys go in there, open the glove box and tell me who owns that car? And I was like, hell yeah, I will. This is so Jason Bourne as an eight-year-old going through the parking garage, right? One of the earliest memories that I have of my father, we're in Pasadena, California. We're sitting there. We're just in a mall. Do the malls still exist today? Do you guys know? Yeah, kind of, somewhat. And we hear this blood-curdling scream. And um, there's lots of different screams, and I, in, in my career, unfortunately, are so familiar with them. The scream of a child that can't scream anymore, and it turns more into a whimper. Man, I, heard, I hate that. You know, like it still rocks my soul when I hear it. The scream of somebody that is scared to death for their life. And then the, scree, the scream of, I'm useless. 
I'm scared. I can't do anything. And this involuntary sound is coming from my body. It was one of those screams. My dad looks over at my mom. He's like, hey, just hang out here. Gets out, locks the door, goes over, scuffs this dude up that's beating this woman in this parking lot. It's one of my earliest memories. He didn't, hold, he didn't, mo- he didn't wait not a second. Yesterday, a soldier in Texas died as he was in the Rio Grande River and a woman fell into the water. The only thing that they found of him was his body armor and radio because he tore away the quick release and just jumped into the water after her. That is that same care, compassion, and monster all in a human form. Right? I, a weak man isn't a good man. We've heard this Jordan Peterson quote, right? It's a powerful, strong man that knows how to use control and kindness and patience. But you first have to be a monster, right? You first have to be able to go out and do volumes of work. And if people are looking at me now, they're like, hey, you're an author, you're a movie producer, you're on TV shows, you own eight different companies, you work out two times a day, you're still trying to compete at the highest level. I'm super pissed right now because Jason Kalipa has like the rowing record out there and, and I'm behind him by seven meters. Don't worry, Jason, you in here? Okay, coming for you, bro, <laughs> right? But there's a reason that he's number one out there because he's the competitor, Right? And I'm looking at that I'm like, all right, how do I get seven extra meters out of 20 poles? And I got it. I'm coming. But that, this is this, aw- this constant hunger for wanting to improve. I want to be a monster. But do you think my two-year-old daughter or my daughters that are freshmen and sophomore in college that look at me and are scared? Nah, not in the slightest, right? Like I'm the pushover. I'm the softest little thing on the planet. But then I'll also take one of their dude's faces off and I'll wear his skin as a birthday suit. <laughs> so, I was 20 years old, and I was, uh, I sw- walked out to Morrow Bay, California. Anybody know where that is? Morrow Rock? So if you're on the north side of the rock, there's some pretty unforgiving currents and some pretty good uh, waves. I took all my clothes off, took my keys, Took my pager. You know what that is? No. Dropped it on the beach, and I took my, my naked butt, and I started swimming due west from that, the west coast. So I swam. Uh, my dad was an Olympic, Olympic level swimmer, so I grew up in water. And um, so I, I can swim. I can still swim. And uh, so I'm, I'm a guess, 30, 40 minutes later, I'm a little bit further than two miles out. I swam directly into the fog. And um, at this moment in my life, I have a few women pregnant. I'm fairly certain I have AIDS. And um, 9-11 just happened. And uh, I was not trying to kill myself. But I needed some heart. Right? I needed to breathe. I needed to feel. So I just kept swimming. The fog comes in. If you've ever been surrounded by fog, um, it does really weird things to sound in a, ref- in, uh, in a really uncomfortable way. So normally you can hear the waves crashing. I couldn't hear them. There's a fog horn that's just south on the end of the breakers. I couldn't hear that. I thought I could. Maybe I couldn't. I could hear waves lapping or was that a fish jumping? I had no idea. And um, now I'm just treading water because I have no idea which direction the shore is. Uh, but I'm fairly certain I'm, I'm going to die here. I'm treading water, treading water, and it is cold. Morro Bay, California is 50. 54 degrees. I've been out there half an hour now, maybe 45 minutes. I hear this low rumbling. I was like, cool, that's impending death. Fantastic. And up route cruises this Coast Guard boat, and there's this dude, not the Coast Guard, don't, I'm not giving a positive story about the Coast Guard. So just <laughs> pump the brakes. And the captain, he's sitting there, he's dangling his feet just like I am right here. And he leans over and he's like, hey, what's up? Like, what's up with you? I'm on a boat. Well, I'm fucking swimming. He's like, I see that. So, uh, so you doing all right? He's like, cool, dude, I'll, I'll, I'll tell him what's going on. So I give him the, a brief executive summary of what's happening in my life right now. He's like, I, I was going to offer to pull you on board, but to tell you the truth, I'm just going to leave you in the drink. And I'm sitting there, I'm cold. So I tell him, I, I hear you, but I'm cold. And he leans over and he's like, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I was like, this guy's a jerk. 
but I'm still treading water. And uh, and he's like, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna give you this option one time because I'm gonna respect your body more than you've respected it yourself. I'm gonna offer you to come on board, but I'm never gonna offer it again, and nobody else ever is. And um, so I climb on board. He throws this little net over the side. He doesn't even help me. Like I have to clamber up your my hand. Your, when you've been in water that long, um, your hands are numb, and uh, that rough navy rope it does not feel good. And your tiny little pecker rubbing against the side of the boat does not feel good. And then he takes one of those wool navy blankets and he throws it over. And it felt like millions of little needles jabbing me in my back. And it was the most wonderful feeling I've ever felt because I was alive. So humans are more important than hardware. That was the beginning. That was the turning point of what I started to do and how I approached everything in life. I failed a lot. I failed in Afghanistan. I failed in Iraq. I failed in Africa. I failed in South America. Counter poaching, counter human trafficking, counter drug. I failed, I failed, I failed, but I did not go under the water. You have to care. You have to be a monster. This dude doesn't have an eye right now, but do you think that if I tried to stab him in the throat, that it would be one of the toughest fights of my life? Yeah, absolutely, because he's still a monster, right? There's something inside that not only do you choose, but then you condition, and through regiment and discipline, that starts taking shape. And then once that thing starts taking shape on that spectrum where you take the best of both worlds, I am an insurmountable monster that cannot be defeated. I am so competitive. I will never give up. And I freaking love this thing about life. And everybody's mission is going to be a little bit different. And I'm not going to tell you what yours is, but you need to find out what it is. Because without it, without that purpose... Maybe it's serving your church. Maybe it's serving your community. Maybe it's still serving the brotherhood. Maybe it's trying to be able to give back to this beautiful country and all the freedoms because we know what the other end of not having freedom looks like. Having been in three different revolutions and two different coups, I'll tell you what, freedom's pretty rad. You better learn how to start fighting for it. But you won't be able to fight without a heart. And you won't be able to fight without regiment and you won't be able to fight without discipline. Do you think the Ukrainians right now are being successful because they lack heart? No, right? They're monsters. Do you think that they would be successful right now without having years of resistance training, understanding unconventional warfare and guerrilla warfare? No, they would have got steamrolled by the Russians, but they got them both, right? They have the ability and the capacity to be a monster, and man, they love not being Russians. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to leave you with. I want you to have those two things. Humans are more important than hardware. You cannot have quantity over quality. Pick quality and be a human. But you got to be a monster. And you got to work your ass off with the discipline and regimen. Otherwise, you're going to get steamrolled by the Russians. All right. God bless you guys. We're going to have a blast tomorrow.